I love it. The Potomac River. To imagine that not being there. That was built at the turn of the century, around 1898, 1899. It's called Battery Isaac Eugene. Last piece of information I want to give you is going to be our departure time. Service, more specifically, with Fort Sumter and Fort Moultrie National Historical Park. Now, our park name has two forts in it, but this is only one fort. This is Fort Sumter. Fort Moultrie is across the water. This big old 200 pound pair of rifle right here is sort of pointed at it. You grab that, and now we spread apart. And this is the small flag. All right, so here's what I want you to think about as a symbol. This flag can mean something different to each and every one of us, and I want to walk you through some of its meaning. I can wait. I'm very I want to walk you through some of its modern and some of its historic meanings. We're going to start with the historic. I want you to think about what this flag represents for this guy right here. Major Robert Anderson puts it up over the fort. It goes up over the fort in the face of secession. South Carolina secedes. They're the very first state to do so. They did that in December of 1860. Why do they do that? Because of the election of Abraham Lincoln. What's their problem Lincoln? Well, they spell that answer out for us in their article or their ordinance of secession. They say that they are seceding because of the election of the president hostile to slavery. Why is Abraham Lincoln seen as hostile to the institution of slavery? Because he doesn't like it. Part of his campaign promise has been the non-expansion of slavery. We've never said that it existed, it can continue to exist. But every new state admitted to the union guaranteed to be a free state. Abraham Lincoln faced the greatest crisis in the nation's history. To meet it, he made the boldest use of presidential power. At the moment of inauguration, Fort Sumter was under siege. Lincoln made a fateful decision. He would send relief to Sumter's garrison. The South gave its answer. Pressing ahead of a frightened Congress, Lincoln wielded power vigorously. He called for 75,000 voluntary enlistments, ordered a blockade of the entire Confederate coast, assumed personal direction of the armed forces, banned northern papers criticizing the war effort, and in defiance of the courts, suspended habeas corpus. Enemies in Congress were outraged. The Constitution does not say that the President has the right to declare martial law. I'd like to read this statement, gentlemen, if I may. I think the man whom, for the time, the people have under the Constitution made the Commander-in-Chief of their Army and Navy bears the responsibility for making this decision. It was virtually government by presidential decree. But Lincoln's bold executive leadership saved the Union. With peace came great national changes. Now up until this point, the country tried to deal with this problem a couple of different ways, in terms of admitting new states to the U.S. and deciding whether or not they would be considered a free state, where slavery is not allowed, or a slave state, where slavery is allowed. They had tried a couple of different things. Number one, they would flip-flop between admitting states to the Union, free state, slave state, free state, slave state. They tried popular sovereignty, where they would let the people of the state vote on whether it should be free or slave. That resulted in something called Bleeding Kansas, which you probably haven't heard about since like high school history, but you know it's not good because it has the word bleeding in it. They also tried compromises, like the Three-Fifths Compromise. 
you may remember, the three-fifths compromise says that a person of color is worth three-fifths of a white person. They tried to deal with this a whole bunch of different ways. Finally, Abraham Lincoln comes along, non-expansion of slavery is not going to expand, it can continue to exist where it already does. South Carolina says that's not good enough, we're leaving the union, they fill out the paperwork, like I just said, they say because of the election of a president hostile to slavery. Major Robert Anderson puts a 33-star U.S. flag up over the fort in the face of secession. Eventually, this will come to the opening shots of the Civil War. The Civil War starts right here. You are at a one-of-a-kind place. There is no other place in the entire world where the American Civil War began. It started right here. It's going to last around four years. The very first death of the Civil War happens out here. Current estimates say that the Civil War takes 700,000 lives. It's the deadliest war in America's history. It started right here. Think about what this flag represents when it goes up over the fort in the face of that secession. After a 34-hour bombardment, Major Anderson is going to have to take down his U.S. flag and evacuate. And for the next four years, Confederate forces are going to control the fort, and a Confederate flag is going to fly over the fort. I'd like to encourage you to think about what the Confederate flag represented when it went over the fort. To use the words of the Vice President of the Confederacy, Alexander Stevens, he said the cornerstone of that new government, the cornerstone of the Confederacy, was the idea that slavery subordination to the superior race was natural and normal. Those are his words. So that flag flies over this place for almost four years. For the last two years of its occupation, the federal government takes Morris Island, which is behind me where that lighthouse in the distance is, that's where the movie Glory happened, that's where the movie Glory passed, that's where the infantry was. And for two years, they launch over 44,000 projectiles at the fort. They take it from a three-tier fort down to a one-tier fort. The original fort is about three stories tall. If you can see the red line on the flagpole, that's how tall this exterior brick wall was all the way around the fort. They absolutely destroy the fort. In 1865, Confederate forces evacuate. The federal government comes back in with the U.S. flag over the fort. April 9, 1865, the Civil War is considered to be over with a surrender at the Appomattox Courthouse. And I'd like you to think about what that flag represents. It represents freedom for over 4 million enslaved men, women, and children. But not really. It's just the start of freedom. They still have to wait for a 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, and even the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Stuff is still modern and still we are experiencing the repercussions of it. In a more modern sense, what does the U.S. flag represent for you? If you're a civilian, you see the flag everywhere. It's ubiquitous, you kind of stop thinking about it. If you're a park ranger, you get paid every two weeks by the federal government. The U.S. flag has a very special meaning for you. If you or someone you know or love has served in the military, the U.S. flag has a very special meaning for you. If you're visiting us from a foreign country, say France, the U.S. flag will have a very special meaning for you. And if you were born in a different country, became a U.S. citizen, the flag has a very special meaning for you. So when the flag goes up, it goes up quickly, and when it comes down, it comes down slowly. So I'm going to try to raise it quickly in this breeze today. I would like to encourage you to think about what the flag means to you personally as it goes up today. Now, a couple of things. Number one, this is a flag program, not a flag ceremony, which means you don't have to salute. You're not going to play the national anthem. You don't have to shed one single tear because this is the most moving moment of your life. But if you do, it's okay because a flag is a very powerful symbol. And the last thing before we get this flag up is it's a breezy day. As I raise the flag, the breeze is going to catch the flag and it's going to try to slap your faces off. So just duck, dip, dodge, dive, duck, whatever you have to do to avoid the flag. Don't get hit in the face. Hold on to your hats and your sunglasses. Are we ready for the raising of the colors? Yeah. All right. Thank you all so much for your time today, for visiting, for listening to the Ranger Talk, for helping us put up the flag. We literally can't do it ourselves. I'm saying goodbye now because I'm going to be out of breath by the time this thing gets to the top. So once it goes to the top, I'm going to start tying it off and that will be the end. Spend the rest of your time the way that you see fit. If you would like to see the original 33 star flag that was flying over the fort during the opening of the Civil War, that is in our museum just down the stairs here, along with a 3D museum of what the fort used to look like before it was destroyed. Let's go ahead and raise the colors. All right, when you feel a tug, let go. It's not that strong. All right, here we go.
Thank you again for visiting for some.